All right, good evening, everyone. We begin the readout tonight with Russia and neighboring Ukraine on the brink of war, with Vladimir Putin ordering Russian troops into two Moscow-backed breakaway regions within eastern Ukraine. That after Putin announced he would formally recognize the independence of those regions where Russia has been supporting armed separatists in an eight-year conflict. Putin addressed Russia today in an hour-long, rambling, made-for-television speech filled with grievances while offering what many experts call a false interpretation of history. Sound familiar? Putin claimed, and we are translating this from Russia, from Russian, that Ukraine is a historical part of Russia that was illegitimately taken from Moscow and is now run by a puppet regime controlled by the U.S. and the West. Ukraine has never had traditions of its own statehood, according to Putin, calling the eastern part of Ukraine ancient Russian lands. The remarks coming from a dangerous paranoid man who honestly came across as also unsound, further stoked fears that Putin is looking to reacquire all of Ukraine, part of his master plan to claw his way back to the time of Mother Russia before the fall of the Soviet Union, before the loss of the states that once made up the USSR, a change that, by the way, was primarily led by the 1991 exit of Ukraine from the Union of Soviet Socialist Republics. Almost immediately, the White House announced that Biden signed an executive order prohibiting new investment, trade, and financing by U.S. persons to, from, or in the so-called DNR and LNR regions. Germany and the U.K. announced that they would follow suit. The U.N. Security Council will meet later tonight to discuss the situation in Ukraine. And joining me now from Moscow is NBC News senior international correspondent Keir Simmons from Kyiv. NBC News correspondent Aaron McLaughlin, and also joining me, Masha Gessen, staff writer for The New Yorker and author of Surviving Autocracy. Um, thank you all for being here. So let's just go around the, the, the sort of horn here. I'm going to start with you, Kier. Give us kind of the sense, because this has gotten as serious as it gets. Um, what's your sense from where you are? Yeah, it's pretty serious, uh, Joy. I mean, the Interfax uh, news agency, that Russian news agency, now reporting that two large uh, military columns are in Donetsk, that uh, separatist region in, in eastern Ukraine, with uh, armored vehicles. The reports that Russia is already sending peacekeepers, in inverted commas, uh, into that area of eastern uh, Ukraine. So, I mean, you could call that an invasion. I mean, it's open mi Russian military forces going into eastern Ukraine. Today, President Putin recognized those separatist regions of eastern Ukraine, but with his military there now, and even with the treaties he signed, Joy, uh, including agreements for the Russians to build military bases in eastern Ukraine, well, you could call that too an annexation. It rips up the Minsk agreement, that agreement, that peace deal uh, that they reached uh, back in uh, 2014. That deal has been very difficult to implement on both sides, but that's done for, that's over. And I think one of the things you can really say about that performance by President Putin on Russian television is that's not a man who's scared. He was sitting back, uh, he, he looked frankly relaxed and angry and ranting. Uh, he didn't have notes. As you say, he spoke for a minute. He didn't seem frightened by the potential for sanctions. And now the real question is, what will the sanctions be? Because here's another point. Just a year ago, for example, the idea of Russian troops ultimately, uh, openly going into eastern Ukraine, well, that would have been enough to bring the West heavily down on Moscow. But is that what we're going to see? Because this isn't as much as the West had feared. What will happen next is, is another question. But again, President Putin, his inner core, if you like, these are people who are already sanctioned, who can't leave Russia, and they are not acting like they are frightened by anything that's been threatened so far. Well, and Aaron, let me bring you in on this because, right, I mean, the point is that, you know, there is, there are things that um, it seems that Putin has done to sort of build up enough sort of reserves in case sanctions happen. Let's just look at some of the options that are there. Uh, there's the option to cut Russia off from Society for Worldwide Interbank, uh, the Society for Worldwide Interbank Financial Telecommunications called SWIFT, uh, ban sales of sovereign bonds, limit access to U.S. made technology, freeze their assets of high ranking Russian officials. There are things that, that they could, you know, that could be done. It looks like sanctions will happen. Um, but if they're lying enough about what's happening in Ukraine to claim that they need to send in peacekeeping forces when there is nothing to send peacekeeping forces for, creating just a false pretext, then all of this sort of weird historical layering to try to make an excuse for doing this, I, I do wonder, um, you know, what is the thinking about how effective sanctions would be and how extreme would they need to be in order to make a difference? 
Well, uh, very effective if you speak to Ukrainian officials. They've been calling for sanctions for some time now. Uh, most recently in Munich, uh, the Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky calling on world leaders to issue sanctions then, saying, what are you waiting for if you're so sure that Russia is going to invade? And we are yet to hear from the Ukrainian president following uh, this latest move from the Kremlin. He is expected to speak tonight. It's 2 a.m. in the middle of the night, and yet any minute now, now he could address the country in what will arguably be one of the most important speeches of his entire career. One of the big overhanging questions in all of this is how will the Ukrainian military respond, especially if these Russian peacekeepers move into separatist-controlled areas and push past the line of contact? So far, the Ukrainian military have been ordered to exercise restraint, not to provoke the situation, with President Zelensky saying that one cannon fire, one artillery artillery round could spark a greater war. Now, in terms of his speech tonight, we do expect for him to try and maintain a sense of calm. It's something that he has been trying to do for weeks now, saying that panic is an enemy of Ukraine. But I can tell you, I have been speaking to Ukrainians, and they're extremely concerned. I was speaking to one former advisor to President Zelensky who told me he feels like today is 1939 all over again. And he said that listening to President Putin uh, in that hour-long address earlier today. He said that it's very clear to him that President Putin wants to take the whole of Ukraine. That is the feeling that some really key officials here in Kyiv, that's how they feel tonight. Joy. And I will just note that um, it, it does appear that President Zelensky has spoken, or he's beginning to speak now. Um, so he's doing that as we speak. And I know that you'll be going back and covering um, whatever it is he says. But he has uh, essentially said that the incursions already into eastern Ukraine are completely unacceptable. Masha, let me, let me bring you in here. Because it felt unhinged. It may not have seemed like a fearful leader uh, of, a, of a country that wants to be um, sort of top dog on the world stage equal to the United States, but it definitely sounded paranoid. Um, it, it was a full redress of old grievances and this longing to bring um, Ukraine back inside of, I guess, a sort of recreated old USSR. It didn't sound hinged. Um, but what do you make of, of that? And the fact that this man does appear to be ignoring the entire world's admonitions to not do this and threats of sanctions and seems to be doing it anyway. Well, the most important thing that Putin said today actually wasn't uh, that Ukraine is historically part of Russia. The most important thing he said today was that the entire body of laws on which the dissolution of the Soviet Union was based was illegitimate. He basically has canceled Russia's recognition of the post-Soviet geography. Um, and that is a threat not only to, uh, against Ukraine, that is a threat actually against every country uh, that used to be part of the Russian Empire and the Soviet Union. That includes Finland, that includes the Baltic states, but most immediately it includes Ukraine. So that's the most important thing. Uh, no, he didn't sound pure. He sounded resolved, and he sounded like he was announcing to the world that the entire post-Cold War order has been canceled. The other thing that he has been saying before, and that he said today during the, um, it indicated today during the uh, fake live broadcast of the Russian Security Council, was that they're basically trying to create a kind of caricature of the air war in Kosovo in 1999. They're laying down the pretext for claiming that in these so-called breakaway regions, because they're not actually so-called breakaway regions, and they're not actually run by Russian-backed uh, uh, separatists. They're actually Russian-occupied, Russian-controlled fake separatist regions. So in these so-called uh, breakaway regions, uh, he's claiming that there's uh, discrimination against Russians, that there's uh, systematic uh, violence against ethnic Russians and Russian speakers in Ukraine. They're throwing around the word genocide. And what they're preparing the ground for is airstrikes uh, in, against Kiev and installing a puppet government uh, in Kiev, which I'm afraid Putin imagines will be easy to do. He imagines it'll be easier to do, but imagining and doing it are two different things. I mean, I, 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 do, do you have the sense in, in studying what Russia is now that they would have the military capability to restore, to do what it is that he claims to want to do? Because that seems beyond 
the normal sort of capabilities of a country um, like Russia. But I, I, is, is that something that even is feasible? Because that sounds like madness. I think Putin actually has a very good idea of what his military is capable of. What he doesn't have the imagination for is the Ukrainian population. He doesn't understand that he's talking about a country that has true civic cohesion, cohesion, where people have actually sacrificed their lives and are fully aware that more than 100 people died during the Revolution of Dignity in 2013-2014 uh, to secure free and open elections. Um, people will stand to the last in Ukraine. This is also a country that has had, but that has been partially occupied by Russia for the last eight years. It has had a shooting war, a hot war, for the last eight years that daily claims casualties. So this is a mobilized, resolved nation. This is a nation where even eight years ago, students, you know, uh, people I knew because they were postdocs, I knew them through academic circles, you know, volunteered to go fight against Russia in the East. Um, this, is, this is a country that will not tolerate the installation of a puppet government. And that's something that Putin simply cannot imagine. He is used to dealing with his own country. Right.